with a round of applause. Join me as we welcome God's choice servant, my father, Apostle Michael Orobo. I know most of us, this is most likely the first scripture we encountered when we became Christians or believers in Christ Jesus. Ah, let me read from KJV. It said, John 3.15. into 16 he said that whoever believeth in him should not perish this is Paul trying to explain and to give us perspective as to why Jesus came talking about the son of God he said whoever believe in him will not perish but have eternal life he said for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life so he used two words to connote what we are about to study this morning. The first is that he said whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And then the second aspect he said whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And I told us that the teachings we have received over the years try to define this concept from two perspectives from a qualitative perspective and from a quantitative perspective and these two teachings are very beautiful they are very excellent we have worked with it and it has brought us to where we are in fact we have not even perfected that as it were and so it's it's a risk trying to go further nevertheless we have to because the bible said the standard of god standard sure God will not lower his standard, but he has provided grace for us to attain his standard. Praise God. And so this scripture shows us the two dimensions from whence this subject is studied. In verse 15, he referred to it as eternal life. And in verse 16, he referred to it as everlasting life. And the teachers that God has blessed us with, some who raised us and some who raised even the fathers that raised us have defined this subject from a qualitative aspect and a quantitative aspect. A quantitative aspect because they considered everlasting life as a life that will not end. And that's why when you receive Christ, everlasting life is promised to you. That means your journey on earth does not end with death. What they let you know is that even after you die, there is still hope for you because you'll be resurrected to live with Jesus again in the world to come. So the whole idea behind evangelism and preaching of Christ, as far as this context is concerned, is that you are brought into an economy where your life will not end. And so even after death, you still have hope of living with Jesus. That's what they call everlasting life, an unending kind of life. But the truth is that nobody will end. So long as God puts his breath in you, your life cannot end. There's nothing that comes from God that can end. Because God is everlasting. Praise God. And this is why they now take it a bit further into the qualitative aspect. That this life is not just everlasting. Because everybody who have received the breath of God will live forever. But that this life also has a qualitative dimension. And so they delve into eternal life. And when they are explaining eternal life, truthfully, they tell you it's the God kind of life. And they tell you because it's the God kind of life, it's a sickless life. That means you can't be sick or if you are sick, you can overcome sickness. And they also go further to tell you it's, um, it's an undefeatable life. That means whatever challenge you find yourself, it's possible for you to bounce back. And all of these are beautiful. But you see... The reason we are going into this study in order to understand God's standard is that if you begin to pick out qualities to define this life, you will be greatly limited because you will not even know the pool or the context from whence these qualities and parameters you are isolating are derived from. 
And so it's important for you to go into the original context from whence this word was picked before it was translated in the first place. If you study your theology very well, you'll see that sometimes eternal life is used from the word nefes. And what it means is the life that powers a living creature. And so every quality that they perceive that a living being should have, they put them together to define this context. If you go deeper, you will find that the word was derived from the word che olam. And what che olam means is more complex than what we have understood over the years. This kind of life, as far as the Hebrew context is concerned, which is where the, the word was derived from before it was translated, suggest a life that is in a world that has not yet appeared the word eternal life from the hebrew context which is che olam is actually the life of the age to come and so for you to understand eternal life to to build faith to live it you need to understand the economy of the world that is to come so if you begin to study the world that is to come you would understand something that everything we have been taught is included but is more because the qualities that they have isolated to teach us eternal life just gives us an idea that eternal life makes it possible for you not to be sick makes it possible for you to overcome the challenges of this life but what we are talking about is actually deeper than that when you want to understand eternal life you have to understand how the creatures of the world to come will look like because eternal life is actually the life of the world that is to come so what god attempted to achieve when he gave us eternal life was to turn us to creatures of the next dispensation while we are yet in this dispensation and so what god is is trying to what god is is looking at when he looks at you is not just a man because if you define eternal life as a qualitative life, you will be a man trying to live a life that is upgraded. That is what qualitative represents. You will be a man trying to live a life that does not end. But that's not how God sees it. What God is saying is that you are no longer just a man. You are equivalent with the creatures that will live in the world that is to come after this world is over. Because eternal life is the life that the creatures of that world will live when that world appears. So what God has done is that he has brought the world to come into this current world. Anybody who receives eternal life is no longer just a citizen of this world. He is now a citizen of the world that is to come. That is why a Christian becomes a mystical creature. And when Paul began to teach this subject, Paul stopped calling us men. Paul began to call us new creatures because we are actually no longer creatures of this dispensation. We have become creatures of the next dispensation. It's just like, it's like bringing an alien to live in your world. The reason we are not aliens is because we are here legally because of this body. Actually, what we are, if we didn't have this body, would have been an alien because we are actually creatures of another dispensation that have been brought to live in this dispensation but the reason we are not aliens is because a legal body has been given to us so that we can rightfully participate in this economy so when you see us we carry all the features of a man but the life that powers us is not the life that power men is the life that we power the creatures that belong to another generation so in, in, a, in a critical sense it's just like picking a robot just to give you an idea you pick a robot and then you create flesh and clothe that robot but you know that the life of that robot is a machine so even though that robot carries flesh like normal people that robot is not a man that robot is a machine and if you want to test that robot go and run with it the robot will run at an astronomical speed the robot can run faster than a ferrari and when you get tired you will discover the robot doesn't get tired so long as his battery is full that is when you will now discover that although you look alike with the robot but you are different creatures the robot you can make a mistake by looking at the robot and say this is man but when the robot begins to perform you will now discover that mm -mm, 
This one looks like man, but it's not man. If you go to work with a robot, the robot can do the work of 10,000 people. And when the robot finish, the robot doesn't know what it means to be tired. You know why? Because being tired is not calibrated into the economy of the robot. Even when the robot is done working, all the robot needs is charging. The robot doesn't know how to tire. So when the robot works the work of 10,000 men, the robot goes to charge. And when it's done charging, it begins to work again. Almost at the same frequency. And you'll be wondering, what is this? Then you will now know that although this thing looks like me, it is not me. This is why we pray in tongues. When we pray in tongues, we are charging. Because we operate by another life. A normal man, when he's tired, he rests. When a Christian is tired, he prays. So eternal life is not just about qualitative or qualities that you are isolating. We are creatures of another dispensation. God has put us here because he wants to win this world so that every human being on earth can also become a part of that dispensation. The life that power us now is a life of another world. The first person that came to demonstrate that life was Jesus Christ. When Jesus was walking on the earth, he was talking things that men could not understand. They want to kill Jesus and Jesus will tell them, no man can take my life from me. I have the power to lay down my life and to pick it up again. And then you are asking, what do you mean lay down your life and pick it up again? Who talks like that? No man talks like that. So many times when Jesus speaks, they say, no man talks like this. And that's why I was giving you the illustrations I was giving you yesterday. Jesus went up to pray and all the boats left. And then you would think, Jesus, a man should wait for when the boats come back. And suddenly, he faces water and he starts walking towards the water. If you were there, you would say, wait, where is he going? Help this man who he's about to drown. And suddenly, when he reaches where the water is, he starts walking and the water can't drown him. Instead of sinking, he is now walking on the water as though the water is a block. And then you are wondering, is this a man? No, he's not a man. He's a new creature. That's who a Christian is. People are sick. And then instead of looking for a doctor, Jesus shows up and they say, this person is sick. And Jesus holds the person and lifts the person up. And then they say the fever left her. And the question you are asking is, is it the woman he lifted or is the fever he lifted? So you discover that this man is operating by an economy that is superior to men. They say somebody is dead and Jesus shows up and says he's asleep. And then you look at him and start laughing and say, ah, is this person drunk? They say she's dead. Men die. Are you not aware? He's dead. And Jesus said, no, the person is not dead. All of you wait outside. Because if men are here with me, there will be a problem. So he pursued all the men outside. And he walked up into the room and said, young lady, I say unto you, arise. The question is, who talks to the dead? How can you be talking to a dead man as if you are talking to a normal person? Because the life he lives with, he operates with, he talks even to the dead. Because that life doesn't die. And so anything he talks to must hear him. He said, young lady, arise. And the one that was dead rose up as if she was sleeping. And then you now look at this creature, you are now wondering, what are you? Or who are you? Which of them is correct? Whether you should say who are you or what are you? Because when they meet you as a Christian and all they are saying is who are you, it means you are normal. When they look at you, they should ask you what are you? Because the life you are living is not the life of men. You are living the life of God that powers creatures of the next age. That's what eternal life is. And so as believers, we must study this life again and find out if what we are doing is actually what God expects or what religion has taught us. Because today, if we are sick, the first point of call is drugs. But the question is, the life you are living, the creatures of that age, do they take drugs? And I'm not saying anything is wrong with medicine. Because there is also a faith dimension to this truth. Where you grow. Because every being grows. But the question is, if truly you are living the life of another age, the question you should ask is, the creatures of that age, do they take drugs? Imagine if they put skin on a robot. Will the robot wake up and say, I have fever? The question you ask is, do robots have fever? Robots are machines. They are not designed to have fever. And so if a robot has fever, in the realm of that of robots, that is a miracle. 
So your miracle is not when you are healed. Your miracle is when you are sick. Because the age where you come from, the creatures don't fall sick. So if you have that life and you are sick, and another creature comes from that age, that creature will be wondering, how come you are sick? Because where we come from, we don't fall sick. If by any means you are carried to that age, they will take you to the lab to study you, to understand how it is possible for sickness to enter you. So when you say you are healed and you are celebrating as a miracle, the people of your age are actually shocked that you are sick because sickness is the wonder in their world. In their world, they don't fall sick. Are you following? <laughs> Maybe I'm just, what I'm saying doesn't make sense to you. Okay, let me stop. Let's pray. <laughs> imagine, imagine if when Jesus came to the earth, Jesus now fell sick. The angels will be wondering, ah, this is our age. People don't fall sick. This life that you have, don't fall sick. How are you able to be sick? It would have been the greatest wonder of the spirit realm that suddenly sickness has been able to attack a being of this age. How did you fall sick? Every angel would have wondered. Even the Father and the Holy Ghost would have been shocked. How did you fall sick? How are you able to fall sick? Because being falling sick does not operate with that life. That life is inconsistent with sickness. So the reason eternal life is called a sickless life. It's not just because it dominates sickness. The reason eternal life is called a sickless life is because the age where that life comes from, sickness doesn't exist there. And so every Christian who has eternal life, according to God's expectation, should live above sickness. If you are sick, it's either because you are not living that life or because you are a child, you have not understood that life. That's why Jesus said healing is the children's bread. When you mature in eternal life, you will know how to walk that life that sickness can no longer exist in you because sickness is incompatible with that life. Not just because the quality of that life is superior to sickness, because the civilization where that life comes from, sickness can't enter there. That's what Christianity is. Are you following? Are you seeing where we are? As far as God is concerned. And so when you find you come for a healing service or a miracle service, that we even organize healing service among Christians is a wonder. It either means many Christians are not yet aware of eternal life or many Christians are babes. Do you know what the Bible said? It said, if anyone sick among you, let him call for the elders. That means those who have grown, they don't fall sick. He said, the elders will pray for him, the prayer of faith, and the person will be healed. So the elders are like the balm of Gilead. But today, even elders in our churches, <laughs> eldership is no longer a function of how grown you are in eternal life. Eldership is now a function of how old you are in the natural life or how long you have been in church. So we have altered the program. We have changed the structure. And I'm not saying the devil cannot attack you. The devil can attack your health. You will fight and fight your way out. But what I'm saying is that if you have eternal life, you must have a present hour consciousness that where that life came from, the creatures that come from that realm don't fall sick. It is on that basis that you begin to exercise faith for healing. It's on that basis that you begin to exercise faith for divine health. Because if you don't know that, then there's no basis for your faith. You will just be quoting things because it was religiously taught you in the church that you went to. That's why you find many Christians today say, I shall not die. I shall not be sick. They don't even know the basis. If you ask a Christian, why are you saying you will not be sick? Why are you saying you will be healed? Why are you saying you will have divine health? Why are you saying you will resurrect with Christ? They don't even know the basis. The basis is because right now, the moment you receive Jesus, a life has been put on your inside. And that life, the, the, that life did not come from your realm. That life came from another realm. And the realm where that life came from, death can conquer that realm. The realm where that life came from, sickness can conquer that realm. So when you say by his stripes I am healed, it's not necessarily the sacrifice. It's what the sacrifice brought 
that you are anchoring your faith on. You see, many Christians become religious. They are saying the beating of Jesus took away their sickness. The beating of Jesus took away the sickness for two reasons. One, because it is your sin that makes sickness come to you. When Jesus was beaten, he paid the penalty for sin. But the reason you are actually healed is because when Jesus took away the penalty for sin, he brought life into your vessel. The life that Jesus now brought into your vessel makes it impossible for you to be sick. But if you don't know the basis for your healing, you will be quoting that scripture and you will think the more you quote it, the stronger you will become. It is not quoting that Jesus was beaten that healed you. It's becoming aware that because Jesus was beaten, the penalty for sin was taken. And in addition, a life that is above sickness has been put in your body. And so when you are talking those things, you are not looking to heaven, you are looking looking inside that's where maturity begins from that your answer is inside you when Jesus paid the price he put the solution on your inside it's now your job to work it out that's why it says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling but believers are not aware if you tell a believer now if you die what is the basis that you will resurrect? He doesn't even know. He's saying God will raise me up. What is the technology that God will use to raise you? The technology God will use to raise you is because he has put a life on your inside that cannot die. And so when Jesus shouts, that life is stirred. It is the stirring of that life that will make you translate. If that life is not on your inside, no matter how Jesus shouts, you will not resurrect. That's why the rapture is not for the world. Because what God has put on our inside is what will be activated for us to be raptured. When Jesus descends with a shout, everybody that has eternal life, eternal life will be activated to the highest intensity. And that life will dominate you fully. So what you could not achieve through revelation, what you could not achieve through prayer, when Jesus shouts, the full scope of eternal life in your spirit will be awoken. And it is at the rapture that Christians, many Christians, will for the first time experience the full weight of eternal life. Most people will never experience eternal life until at the rapture. If you want to know the physical expression of eternal life on earth, it is at that moment of rapture. The moment rapture comes and Jesus descends and shouts, all of us will be awakened to the full power of eternal life. That's why we will be raptured. So we will become like the creatures for the first time that have the right to contain that life. But there is a possibility that before rapture, you can grow into it. Are you following? And so the practice of Christianity is an attempt to maximize eternal life. Maximize it. Maximize it. Before Jesus comes, many people will experience rapture. Don't make the mistake of assuming it's until Jesus comes that men will be raptured. Many people will experience rapture before Jesus comes many they will literally grow in eternal life to a point that it will become impossible for them to be here it will become impossible they will come to the fullness of eternal life that's what Paul was teaching in Ephesians 4 from verse 13 to 16 he said growing into him in all things even Christ the head of the church Paul was saying that we can grow into the fullness of Jesus and will become exactly like him. And the Jesus they are talking about now is the resurrected Christ. John was speaking in John 4, 17. He said, as he is, so are we in this world. As he is now. How is he now? He ascended into heaven. How is he now? He is glorified. How is he now? He has conquered death. He said, as he is now. He said, so are we. Not when we rapture in this world. So the apostles knew something. They knew that it was possible to become exactly like Jesus. So their own Christianity was not religion. Their own Christianity was a daily pressing into God so that they can become exactly like Christ. That's why Paul was speaking in 2 Corinthians 5, 2 and 3. He said, for this cause we groan that we may be clothed with our heavenly tabernacle. Paul knew that it was possible for the full weight of eternal life to be awakened. And a man walks into glory. He knew.
Is this strange to you? What you are hearing, is this strange? If you heard this from when you were 10, by now, some of you would have become a wonder. If you heard this when you were 10. You know, the first time I started becoming aware of eternal life, I was listening to Pastor Chris many years ago. And he said something. He said, he had an injury on his hand. And he looked at it. And he said, no. My body should not be injured. And he said, he commanded what was caught. He said, close up. And instantly the body closed up. Instantly the body closed up. And when he started winning souls, you know he was young, but he was learning some very dangerous truths. Very dangerous that you can't teach publicly. And so when he met the likes of Reverend Tom, he said, he told Reverend Tom, I can cut my body and grow it back. And Reverend Tom said, then you must be a witch. And he said, yes, I'm a higher witch. Because I'm superior to a witch. He said, a witch is a kindergarten. A witch has a miniature life. He said, I have a superior life to a witch. I'm bigger than a witch. And he told Reverend Tom, he said, look, he cut his hand. The first thing is that he suspended pain. He was able to, you know, the eternal life is a superior life. So it dominates the physical life. So he suspended pains in his hand and cut the hand. And when the hand was caught, he now commanded the hand to seal up. And the hand sealed up. When you see this man follow these guys, it's no manipulation. No? They have seen things you can't say in the public. And Reverend Tom went home and said, if what this man said is true, I must try it. And he too cut his hand and told his hand to grow up. And the hand grew up. From that day, he started following never to turn back. You are the one who thinks for somebody to follow you, you need to manipulate it. If you start living as a wonder, your whole world will gather under you. The whole world will gather around you. You don't need manipulation. Just become your reality. When I heard that story, something came alive in me. Because my spirit knows this is true. Because if Christianity is the life of God, then we should live like God. Because my son that I just gave birth to one year, two months ago, Every day he's becoming more like me. He is not growing to become like a baboon. He is growing to become like me. So if I have the life of God, the more I grow, the more God I should become. Not godly, the more God. <laughs> People don't. Christianity has been watered down. Watered down. That's why few people will find this truth. They will now become champions. And one million people will gather around them. They will be demonstrating God. You are supposed to be a theater that reveals God. When people want to see God, it's either they are reading the Bible or they are looking at Christians. We are supposed to be a theater that showcases God. Because when we grow, we don't grow in height. We grow in reality. Eternal life dominates you so much that everything that comes out of you is God. Paul knew this. And Paul came to a point where even the sweat that was coming from Paul's body, Paul knew there was power on it. That was why Paul sent his handkerchief. Anything that leaves you carries God's DNA. If you carry my sweat to the lab, you will trace my DNA to it. And so if I have the life of God, then everything that comes out of me must carry God. This is Christianity, but it has not been taught. Eternal life. If you know this, you will know that you are behind in schedule. You are behind. And you know the problem? We are not growing, but darkness is growing. They are not waiting for us. The serpent in the garden is now a dragon. Darkness is not waiting for you. If one gear comes into this place with a demon possessed, you will be shocked what 20 of our intercessors will be doing. They will gather around and be praying. And pray in tongues for four hours. When they, are, they, have, they have wetted their clothes with sweat. They will start giving command. And most likely the demon won't come out. Because even while they are praying. They don't know what they are activating. And so prayer becomes labor. And the, 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 the result of our prayer now. The, the price for our prayer now. Is a wet garment. 
And so you wear suit, you sweat from your neck to your, your stomach, and you sweat from your waist to your knee, and then you are walking as a prayer warrior. And when people look at you, they say, Oh, more. This man, they pray, oh. and that is all. Because Christianity has been watered down. Even the things that should be meant for our advantage, we are doing it, we are not growing. Let me give you five things that I'm able to teach publicly for now. I'm practicing what I'm telling you. This is my life. You know, many people think our life begins and ends with what they see on the pulpit. What we teach here is what God permits us to teach and is the little that we have handled. The major part of our lives is in the closet. When I lie down, see, sometimes I'm coming to preach. What I'm studying is not what I'm preaching that day. Because I have to be 10 years ahead of the people I'm talking to. If not, I don't have the right to talk to them. I can be teaching you about healing. Eh? When I was teaching about healing some four or five years ago, I was learning divine health. Lord, what will I do for my cells no longer to be sensitive to sickness? My cells, my body cells. It's possible to come some, if I come into your presence truly. Moses did not have your life. How did Moses come to a point where at 120 his eyes were not dim and his strength was not abated? Moses stayed in your presence and the glory rested on him so much that Moses could not die. You had to come and kill him. And even after you killed him, the devil was looking for his body. Because the devil knows there's something on Moses' body. How, much, how, how then can me, who say God lives on my inside, be so weak? Because of the glory that traveled with Israel, they walked through the wilderness for 40 years. The Bible said there was none feeble among their tribe. They didn't need one herb. They didn't need paracetamol. They didn't need, uh, co uh, co uh, what do you call it? All of the drugs, chloroquine and everything. How can over 5 million people be, do you know what a wilderness is? The temperature there is more than 40 degrees Celsius. The sand, the sand, if your sand that enters, is like sand that has been boiled, heated with fire. And the Bible said they were walking in that terrible situation for 40 years. He said there was none feeble among their tribe because of the glory that was traveling with them. The Bible said even their clothes was growing with them. Their clothes became sensitive to glory. The clothes they were wearing, that the clothes knew when to grow. Because there was no supermarket to buy clothes for a child. Their shoes were growing with them. So the sandal you gave your son at the age of one is the sandal the boy is wearing at 40. Even sandal, touch glory, sandal began to grow. How then me who have the Holy Ghost on my inside, every day I preach for one week, I lie down like vegetable. I'm looking for some supplements in order to become strong. Mosquito bites me, I fall, I'm already sick. Was mosquito not biting them? How were they able to survive? They didn't have a house to live in. Few people who were rich had tents. Others were sleeping on the floor. Yet, there was none feeble amongst their tribe. What are we practicing? Is this thing Christian? Is this thing religion or is spirit life? Everybody sitting here, if we go to the hospital and do a test now, the paracetamol alone in your blood will still be there for 14 years. Because if you take two tablets of paracetamol, it will take like seven years to purge out of your blood. Meanwhile, you have taken more than 10 kilograms of paracetamol and you are not even yet 40. There is so much chemical in your body already that even if you stop taking drugs, then you die. And you go to heaven at 80, there will still be chemicals. As though your body runs on chemicals. What has happened to us? And please don't get me wrong. I said there is a faith dimension where you grow. But I'm showing you God's standard. God does not expect every one of us to be sick. The only people who are permitted to be sick are children. He said healing is the children's bread. For those of us who have been Christian for at least one year, God expects us to have mastered eternal life to a point where even our cells are becoming sensitive to it. Our body cells. So we now should go into the world and heal the world. He said lay hands on the sick, they will recover. He didn't say pray for the sick. Touch them. There should be something that comes out of you that when you touch a sick person, 
every cell in that person's body knows that something superior is touching him. What are we practicing? Is this religion or spirit life? What direction are we growing? Are we growing to become heads of departments and pastors or we are growing into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ? Sometimes you want to share things like this, you are even careful. Because Christianity has been so watered down that when you are talking, people will look at you and say, hmm, be careful. Wisdom is profitable to direct. Heaven helps those who help themselves. It, uh, see, we are in a mess. We are in a mess. If there's anybody here and doctor say, ah, there's nothing we can do. Even the person knows, he will just start crying. You go to the hospital and the doctor looks at you and say, ah, how are you able to walk here? Lie on the bed quickly. You say, doctor, what happened? What happened? Check my body. He said, how did you come here? How did you see your blood pressure? The person will die. They, just from the way the doctor spoke, the person will die. When HIV started, hey, if you come to the hospital and they say, doctor will just come, before they give you a result, they will say, go to counseling room. They will now tell you first that you see, this is not a sentence to death. However, there is no cure to this infirmity. We regret to announce to you that you are HIV positive. The person, as he is walking home, high blood pressure will start. The moment he reaches his door, hypertension will kill him. Because the word of the doctor is stronger than the voice of an angel. If the doctor tells you, we are sorry, even you know that your pastor is coming just to console you, to help you die peacefully. <laughs> even you know. In fact, you just respect your pastor by granting him audience. And pastor will come and say, don't worry, our God is able to deliver. As he's talking, tears will just come down. You know that this one he's doing is, is encouragement therapy. He's trying to help you die in peace. <laughs> Christianity. You'll find somebody preaching. We have power over sickness. Then they roll somebody with wheelchair. The next thing sermon will change. You know, it is God that heals. And God heals as he wills. If God is not healing you today, he can heal you tomorrow. But don't give up. Don't give up. There is hope in those who believe in Christ Jesus. Welcome to modern day Christianity. A generation must become angry. Eternal life is the life of the age to come. And if you have that life in you, you should live like a creature of the age to come. That is God's expectation. That is God's standard. That is God's requirement. And that's what Christianity is. If you are growing your faith, be growing. Don't be discouraged. But know where you are going to. Don't allow men tell you that we are men. And because we are men, we are weak. Jesus was not weak. Jesus is our standard. Don't allow men tell you that we are men. And because we are men, we make mistakes. How many mistakes did Jesus make? Even where Jesus lived was captured in prophecy. You are reading that it might be fulfilled. That it might be fulfilled. When he was on the cross, he had fulfilled all the prophecies that was written concerning him. He lived a life of 100% precision. There was not one left. Welcome to Nakazo Watch TV. On Nakazo Watch TV, we are a great team and we work on life transforming messages that will bring you into realms of divine encounter with the world of truth. Please, don't forget to subscribe, like and share our videos. God bless you.